And then the other half of me looks at the current coronavirus situation and looks at climate change. It's like, yeah, actually, we, we know what to do in these situations, too. And we're still doing nothing about it. My name is Dr. Victoria Patrician. I'm a professor of environmental studies at the University of Southern California. I have a PhD in geobiology, and for the past 10 years, I have been reconstructing past climates on Earth. Today, we're gonna to be looking at a number of different disaster movies and trying to figure out which one of them did it right, which ones did it wrong, and how maybe they could have been improved. We're gonna start with one of my all-time favorite disaster movies, The Day After Tomorrow, in which the North Atlantic current is disrupted, which causes global cooling, a lot of weather catastrophes, and the dawn of a new ice age. Oh, here we go. A giant tsunami is about to hit Manhattan. Probably not, no. A tsunami is gonna be caused usually by an earthquake, so a tsunami happens when the seafloor suddenly goes up and down. The east coast of the United States is what's known as a passive margin. There is nothing on the seafloor that is gonna cause a giant tsunami unless an asteroid hits in the middle of the ocean. Now, what might happen is that if you have the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet, you will get sea level rise that will start to flood New York. And in fact, this is something New York is very worried about. They have proposed a billion dollar seawall to try to keep out rising seawater. It will never be in the form of a massive tsunami that comes and levels the city in 30 seconds. It's the super freeze. Could a huge air mass come in and freeze everything in its path that quickly? No, that's not going to happen. So in order to do that, you would essentially have to have to stop the sun from existing. Could New York be plunged into some sort of deep freeze? Well, there are a couple scenarios in which, yeah, that could happen. In fact, the Northeast experiences frequently now what is known as a polar vortex. And that happens, you get a lot of really, really deep, cold temperatures. What's happening is that normally all of that really cold air stays around the Arctic Circle. What's happening with climate change is that that air mass is destabilizing and it's dipping down into the continental US, which is actually kind of hard sometimes uh, for people to wrap their minds around because the polar vortex reaching into New York or Boston or anything like that is an actual effect of warming in the Arctic. So it's seemingly getting colder at times is a direct result of warming instead of cooling. Our next movie is The Swarm, which I don't know much about, uh, but we're going to watch the trailer for the movie so we will learn about it together. For more than 20 years, scientists have known that a swarm of killer bees has been headed towards the United States. Now, Warner Brothers and they've presents done nothing. Owen Allen's The Swarm. The Swarm is now a movie I must watch immediately. But could this happen? So yeah, there are there are animal migrations that do kind of invade. I don't think their target is the human race most of the time. They're mostly looking for flowers. Can a swarm of something, a plague of locusts, something like that come and move into the United States? Sure, absolutely. There's no reason to say, I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be like us in the, the 70s Roberts taking them on with flamethrowers, but we are definitely seeing, you know, insects creeping up into our domain that haven't been here before. In Los Angeles, uh, we used to never have mosquitoes. Now we have a lot of mosquitoes that carry things like West Nile, maybe Zika. And the big culprit behind this is that so much of our climate is changing that the insects are now moving north looking for more favorable climates. So could a giant swarm of killer bees invade Texas? Uh, it might not be bees, it might be mosquitoes that carry disease with them, but yeah, sure, we'll give this a why not. Our next movie is Wall-E, uh, an adorable uh, cautionary tale where excessive consumerism has really made the Earth an enormous garbage dump. And the human race now lives on a spaceship waiting for the day when they can return to Earth and when life is again possible on Earth. I love this movie. They got the space junk pretty right. Is the premise of Wally -E possible? Could we have actually trashed this planet to the point where all of uh, humanity has to leave and go someplace else, and then we're just gonna send some robots back in to clean it up? I don't think it would actually, I'm a little more optimistic, I don't think it would ever get to the point where we would actually take off on a spaceship. 
If only because we don't have the ability to get on a spaceship and go someplace else at this moment. So we really do have to sort of take care of what's here because there is no other option for us at this point. I thought it was actually really interesting that they had the wind turbines up there in the beginning. There's a big problem in environmental studies right now with even if you have renewable energy, if you have solar panels or if you have wind turbines, there are parts of those that are enormous, especially the giant fiberglass blades. They're huge and they're not recyclable. We don't really have good answers to that yet. So overall, I'm optimistic that no, we would actually pump the brakes on this before we got as far as Wally. -E. And then the other half of me looks at the current coronavirus situation and looks at climate change. It's like, yeah, actually, we, we know what to do in these situations too. And we know how it's damaging our country, damaging the world, and we're still doing nothing about it. So I cling to optimism. I know there are very smart people, very passionate people. My students I see are working on these problems, but you know, there's, there's a long road ahead of us. Up next, we have San Andreas. In this movie, the San Andreas Fault ruptures, causing a bunch of major earthquakes around the fault. And the only person who can save the day is of course, The Rock. Hollywood signs going down. First of all, uh, if the San Andreas Fault ruptures, like the big one, the big one, if you have, let's say, a magnitude eight earthquake in Los Angeles, will all of the buildings start to crumble instantly? Probably not the way uh, they show in this movie. All of the buildings in Los Angeles are built to withstand a certain amount of shaking. So even if you've ever been in Los Angeles in an earthquake, what you see is the buildings kind of sway back and forth. They're on rollers. So what you have in an earthquake is, is the first wave hits and that's the shaky up and down wave, okay? That is what's known as the P wave. Then what you have um, is the S wave. The S wave comes in and that's the rolling. Now, if you have one big enough and sustained enough, like the, the earthquake took enough time, eventually those safety measures aren't gonna do anything anymore and your buildings would start to fall. Would it be that like all of downtown is affected? Um, probably not because the San Andreas Fault doesn't actually run through downtown Los Angeles. The San Andreas Fault, the system is actually a little more north and east of here. Now, if there was a big earthquake on it, uh, depending on where it was in the fault, that energy could get reflected back into the LA basin and take out downtown Los Angeles, at least do a huge chunk of damage. But it's not actually going to happen in downtown LA. There's, there are other faults, of course, that run through the entire city, but the San Andreas does not. Up next is Mad Max Fury Road, a personal favorite of mine. We're an apocalyptic wasteland uh, where both water and oil have become incredibly scarce. This has collapsed civilization and turned the world into a desert wasteland. I am your redeemer. It is by my hand you will rise. From the ashes. Could we ever worldwide be in a scenario where fresh water is so scarce that we have entered a Mad Max Fury Road scenario? Or the entire globe? Probably not. Basically with climate change, you can just think of wherever you live, whatever the worst part of your weather is, that's the thing that's going to get worse. So here, kind of the, the worst things we have to worry about are drought, wildfires, and high temperatures in the summer. And that's what we can expect to get worse. We can expect less fresh water, we can expect uh, more intense storms delivering less water overall, we can expect way more over 100 degree days. But if you look at, say, what's going to happen in the eastern U.S. or maybe in the Gulf regions, so Texas, uh, Louisiana, what can they expect? It's going to be more intense storms, more flooding, more hurricanes, things like that. So there will still be water on Earth. It will still rain unless we've done some kind of horrible nuclear war scenario where we literally screwed everything up. But in that case, chances are humanity is not making it anyways. So there would still be fresh water in some areas, just not in all the areas. It's also uh, interesting to note that these movies are filmed in Australia and Australia is already at this point, you know, largely a desert. So you know, could it could it get there? Well, parts of Australia are already there. And as we've seen the huge wildfires that have, have spread through the East Coast 
of Australia have really kind of done a number. So we're already seeing these things start to happen. So it's going to be very, very region dependent on whether or not you get to live out your favorite Mad Max Fury Road scenario. So thank you for watching Disaster Movies with us today. It's really interesting to see what Hollywood kind of continually does right and continually does wrong in these scenarios. You know, Hollywood has really latched on to the idea of climate as an impending disaster. And they're right in that respect. It is this slow moving train wreck coming our way. Uh, what they get wrong is that it will be a lot of small changes rather than some big technological thing uh, that, that comes and saves us all. So keep watching disaster movies. They're fun, they're enjoyable, I love them. Uh, just keep in mind that a lot of these things don't have an actual basis in science and could probably never happen. You are never going to freeze solid in 30 seconds, so go on, get in the water.